I've been a veterinarian for 32 years. It sounds like a long time. Um, what else have I done? I have been the uh, president of the Massachusetts Veterinary Medical Association. I was the president-elect for two years, president and then past president. Um, I also am on the veterinary services team of the state of Massachusetts animal response team, um, which is an organization that helps with disaster and, and um, emergency preparedness in the state of Massachusetts. So that was actually formed um, after Hurricane Katrina resulted in the PETS Act, which is the Pets Evacuation and Transportation Standards Act of 2006, which requires all communities to include um, animal preparedness in their emergency planning. Um, so because, I don't know if you guys watch those videos of the people on the roofs of their house with their dog, um, or even the most current hurricanes and flooding all over the country. You have the Cajun Navy coming to save these people in their little rowboats. Um, and there's the guy with nine cats in a crate, right? So people either don't know how to plan um, or they don't know where to go. You know, the concerns if they, you know, try to take their pets to the Red Cross shelter, some Red Cross, the American Red Cross doesn't, I'm gonna put this in air quotes, allow people in with pets, but you can co-shelter pets um, if you have, again, a disaster animal response team setting up an emergency shelter for animals. So that stuff is out there, and so this is, uh, again, a basic pet first aid. I also have another lovely presentation on emergency and disaster preparedness, should be interested in that. <laughs> that might be the next <laughs> lecture that we do. Um, but this is just basically about your own pet and, and what to do in case of an emergency. What is basic pet first aid? Um, so pet first aid is defined as temporary urgent care from the onset of an illness or an injury until the pet can be seen by a veterinarian. So we want you guys to be able to take a look at something and say, I think this is a problem, now what do I do? So it is not a substitute for veterinary care. You know, we get a lot of phone calls from people saying, well, you know, my dog is doing this or my dog is doing that, you know, what should I do? And most of the time we answer, please come in and uh, we'll take a look. But again, it's really good for you guys to know kind of what to look for. So what we're going to cover in this presentation is recognizing normal and abnormal vital signs, understanding early signs and symptoms of an illness, how to perform basic pet first aid measures, and what should be in a pet first aid kit. How do owners inadvertently contribute to pet emergency situations? So this is, you know, this is what we see from our end as veterinarians. So waiting too long to seek emergency care from a vet. Um, so, so again, you know, what are you guys looking at? And, is it an emergency and should you call now or could you watch it for another couple of hours um, and then give us a call or, or tomorrow? Um, so another one that we have is failure to administer medications as directed or give human medications not intended for animals. So a lot of people will call me and say, hey, can I start that diarrhea medication you gave me six months ago because I never finished it the first time. That's really annoying because you should have given it all and you shouldn't have any left behind. Um, and then neglecting to access basic obedience training for your pet. So that's another big one. So emergencies happen because you know, you're calling your dog and your dog isn't trained or um, doesn't have a good recall and then runs out in the road and gets hit by a car. So I mean really basic training is really important as far as making sure they don't get themselves into situations that can become an emergency. So general signs of illness. Changes in behavior, they're more sleepy than usual, they're hiding, they're avoiding interaction, they're grumpy, so that's the cat that goes hides in the closet or the dog that's curled up in a ball on the couch um, and when they're normally kind of asking you to play with their toys or go for a walk. Um, changes in appetite or water consumption, um, so you know they're not drinking as much, they haven't had their breakfast, they left their dinner behind the night before, so those are issues. Um, changes in urination and defecation, um, again having diarrhea, being constipated, um, urinating a lot, asking to go out more frequently, uh, you know, things like that can be a concern. What's in the litter box if you have a cat? Um, changes in ability to perform basic physical activities such as walking, navigating stairs, squatting to urinate and defecate. So, you know, they, they start going for a walk and they pull up lame. Or they go for a walk and they sit down and they say, I'm not going any further. Um, they can't go up the stairs like they did the day before. They try to squat and urinate and they, they stop or they, you know, sit down so far that they fall in it. You know, things like that. Um, changes in mentation, so they're disoriented, they're dizzy, they're confused, they're unaware of their surroundings. Instead of going to, you know, go out the door, they go and they head for a corner, you know, something that's unusual. Or they seem, again, dizzy, their head is tilted, or um, they're falling over, um, things like that. 
So situations that require immediate veterinary care. So any kind of trauma to the head, neck, chest. Again, like getting hit by a car, you know, running into something. I had a dog once that came in. There were these metal benches at the park that she was at, and the metal benches had these really narrow horizontal slats, and the dog went smack first into it because it never saw it. It didn't see those lines as a, as a bench. It just kind of crashed into this bench. The dog had a little concussion. Um, suspected or known poisoning. We're going to talk about poisoning a little bit later. Um, unexplained seizure activity. That's another one. Dogs and cats shouldn't have seizures. Um, so anything that looks like a seizure, they fall over, they get stiff, they paddle, um, anything that seems unusual about that. Um, arterial bleeding. That would be like blood spurting out of your body. Venous bleeding, you know, it's kind of slow. It's what happens when you cut your finger. Um, but things that like, it's actually like spurting. And that's, that's certainly an emergency. Any kind of fracture, um, shock, um, if the animal has been unconscious, so again, that dog who bashed himself into the park bench, you know, was unconscious for a short period of time. He woke up and then we took him to the vet, so. More situations requiring immediate veterinary care. Respiratory distress, or whenever rescue breathing or CPR has been administered, you know, so we're gonna show you how to do CPR and rescue breathing, but even if you get the dog back or the cat back, you wanna bring them in and make sure that everything is okay because things can happen. Um, wounds that are greater than an inch in length or a half inch deep, like bite wounds or puncture wounds. We see this a lot from the dog park. They step on a piece of glass or a nail or they get into a dog fight. So we wanna see those, we wanna clean them up and make sure they don't get infected. Um, acute abdominal distension, unproductive vomiting, straining to urinate or defecate. So if this, the stomach blows up on a, on a dog, typically looks like he's just swallowed like a big balloon. Um, that dog is, there's, a, a real concern with that dog might be bloating, where his stomach may have um, twisted on its axis and he's unable to pass anything back or forth. That's a, a life-threatening emergency. Um, unproductive vomiting, um, so I, foreign bodies, things like that. So they just continue to vomit and not bring anything up. That's a concern. We had a little puppy come in the other day who swallowed, it looks like it was a ping pong ball maybe on the x-ray, it was this little round ball. But he was throwing up and he ended up having to have surgery. Um, straining to urinate and defecate, Defecate may be not so life-threatening, but especially urinating in cats. If they're straining to urinate and they're not producing anything, those cats are blocked. Um, they can't pee at all, and that will kill them within a very short period of time because the back pressure goes back up into their kidneys and can cause kidney failure. Um, inability to walk, tripping, falling, appearing dizzy. Again, that animal could have had a seizure, could have had a stroke. Um, there are some more benign causes of things like that, but again, we would want to determine that for you. So triage, so assessing an emergency situation. Um, is the animal breathing? That's always, that's always an important one to note, if your animal is breathing. Um, always check for breathing first. Um, if the animal is breathing, then the heart is actually beating. That's just the way Mother Nature works. Um, absence of breathing is considered a life-threatening emergency. Oh, that makes sense. Um, so then the rescuer needs to perform rescue breathing. And again, we're gonna talk about that. So breathing, we like breathing. Um, is the animal's heart beating? No pulse is detected and the animal has stopped breathing. Um, within minutes, irreparable cell damage will occur because there's just not enough oxygen getting from the, from the bloodstream into those organs if we're not beating and we're not breathing. This is a life-threatening emergency. So rescuer needs to perform cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation. And we'll talk about the difference between CPR and CPCR. Um, and so we're gonna show you how to do that as well. And then lastly, um, is the animal in physical distress? Heart and lungs are working, but something's not quite right. Um, and distress may range, again, from unproductive or profuse vomiting, copious diarrhea, disorientation, agitation. Um, distress may or may not be life-threatening. Um, rescuer needs to consider if first aid alone is appropriate or if they should transport the animal to the veterinarian. So that's kind of the triage that we hope that you guys can, can perform. So vital signs. So, this is always, so I teach a class in basic animal rescue training to first responders. So my favorite question is always, you know, how fast do you think a cat's heartbeat goes? Because, you know, they're looking at people and, and they're never, they cannot imagine trying to count um, a heartbeat in a cat that's 180 beats per minute. You know, that's really fast. Um, so anywhere from 120 to 180, I often hear over that. The other day I had a cat come in, so I see something wrong with this cat's heart. It was actually beating at 350 beats per minute. That is five times a second. That heart is not functioning really normally for that cat. Um, but they're much faster than people and far faster than dogs as well. So 
smaller animals tend to have a faster heart rate. So puppies will have a heart rate of 120 to 160 beats per minute, small dogs 100 to 160, and then medium to large dogs 70 to 120 beats per minute. So it's something that you should check at home. You should check your pet's heart rate to kind of see what normal is for them. So you do it, you know, twice a week and, and kind of get a feel for what their normal heart rate should be. So an abnormal heart rate. So the pulse is a measure of your pet's heart, your pet's heart to pump blood efficiently through the body. Um, so a fast pulse can indicate fear. So we see that a lot of the animal hospital. Fever, we see that too. Pain, yes. Blood loss, because the less blood you have, your heart's gonna try to beat faster to get that smaller amount of blood through your body. Dehydration or heart disease. A slow pulse can indicate a normal athletic pet. So dogs that are in really good shape have a slower heart rate. Um, shock hypothermia, which is a low body temperature, metabolic disease, or heart disease. Um, pulse deficits are when the pulse rate is different from the heart rate and may indicate cardiovascular disease. So when I examine an animal, I'm listening to their heart with a stethoscope, but I also have my hand on their pulse. So every time that heart beats, I should feel that pulse in their back leg and it should be equal. They should be going at the same time. So you're gonna feel beat pulse, beat pulse. Um, if that's not happening or the pulse is at a different rate than the heart, I know that that's, that's a concern. Something's going on. So how do we assess heartbeat? So the heartbeat is located on the left side of the chest where the bent elbow contacts the rib cage. And I will show you on Zeus, although I don't think he bends his elbows. Um, the femoral artery is another location located on the inner surface of the thigh next to the femur. So on people, we have better peripheral pulses. We have one here, you have one in the neck. Dogs don't do that. There aren't really great pulses in their forearm or in their carotid. Their veins in their neck are buried really deep inside a lot of muscles. So we basically listen to their heart and then I feel their pulse right on the inside of their thigh. So that's where we're gonna do that. We're gonna show you a picture of that. Um, you're gonna count the number of beats in 15 seconds and multiply by four, or you can count them for 30 and multiply by two or 10 by six, I mean, whatever you want. Um, depends on how we're doing that day and uh, how still the animal and they're not growling and if the cat's not purring, you know, so those are things that you wanna be able to do is check and see how many times a minute they're beating. So practice checking your pet's normal heart rate. I think that's really important to do to kind of get a feel for what it is. You guys get all your notes? Yes, we have a question in the back. So, um, cats and dogs, you can check their heart rate either on the left side of the chest or the right side of the chest. Mm -hmm. Do you have any idea how long it takes for them to Although you are not going to be able to feel a cat's femoral pulse as well as you can a dog. It's just the way they're built. So I stick with the heart rate on a cat. I rarely palpate a cat's pulse. So, but it's just question easy. With, from question from the no, back. No, on the back. Oh, all right, sorry. <laughs> So yeah. I, I, you said normal, um, I, I was gonna ask about normal variation in heart rate. So if someone got used to taking their pet's pulse, yes. how much variation might there be day to day just between sun up, sun down, when I'm happy, when I woke, 20 beats per minute? Maybe, yeah, yeah, yeah not too much. So I mean, they, I wouldn't, if you're gonna take a heart rate when they come in after they've been running around the backyard, it's definitely gonna be higher than if they've been sleeping on the couch. Yes. And that's okay. Yes. They should just be I would probably, maybe yes. 20, 30 beats. Yes. And I would try to do it repeatedly after the same activity. So if I wanted to check what my dog's heart rate was after exercise, I would do that a couple of times and get a feel for what he's doing. Or I might check it after he goes, you know, maybe sleeping on the couch and kind of get what a resting heart rate is going to be. So certainly that's going to be different, just like with people that stress test. There were two parts in the question. Oh, say, thank you. Um, when, when you talked about animal breathing, uh, yes. how would people check the breathing? Are they looking at movement in the ribcage or are they looking, listening at the pet's nose? Okay, well, Mr. Searle, if you waited asking. until the rest of the PowerPoint presentation, I'm know. going to address that. No, this is yes. a question. I understand that, that, but that is coming up. Okay. If you can be patient. Okay. All right, thank you. All right. That's my husband, by the way. <laughs> and it's not like he didn't help me put the PowerPoint presentation together. Okay, so the location of the heart, again, left side of the chest at the level of his elbow. So if we were to look at Zeus, our little friend here, volunteer. the volunteer, it is, it's going to be right here. So if I could bend his leg, which I can't, sadly, um, his, so where his elbow is, where his elbow meets the chest, that's where it's going to be. So if I bent my dog's elbow and stuck it on the side of his chest, it's going to be right there. You should feel it right there. 
what are you doing? <laughs> I'm just trying to show where it No, was. okay, it's like right here, right there. Okay. So again, this is his elbow, and if you bend his elbow a little bit and just press it right against his chest, it's gonna be right there. And again, just practice with that, because then it'll make it easier the next time. So the location of the femoral artery is on the inner side of his thigh at the edge of his femur. So now we're gonna stick him up in the air. <laughs> so it's gonna be like right here. So right in here, so right on the edge of his, and you're gonna feel the bone, which is his femur, and it's gonna be right at the edge of that. So the landmark to feel for is the bone. Either side. Either side, yes, correct. He should have a femoral artery on both his legs. <laughs> That's always helpful. So now we're gonna show you how to do this with a video. Hi, I'm Dr. Q with DrQuestin.com, and today I'm going to show you how to measure your dog's heartbeat. One of the ways that you can do that is actually to just put the flat of your hand right here on the dog's chest, right about the level of the armpit, and hold very still. A normal dog's heart rate is about 70 to 120 beats a minute with 70 for the bigger dogs and 120 for the smaller dogs and with some variety in there for excitement. But sometimes it can be tough to really feel it right here and see if you can tell what you're actually measuring. So in veterinary medicine, the best way for us to actually measure a heartbeat in a dog if we don't have a stethoscope is the femoral pulse, which is just right on the inside of the groin. So what I'm gonna do is run my hand down her belly here. This is Sushi, my friend who's gonna help demonstrate. One hand down her back, and then I'm gonna slip my full palms of my hands right down into the center of her thigh with my thumbs on the outside. And I'm gonna just hold real still and feel for that pulsing femoral artery. This is a great place to feel a pulse on a dog. If you just are still and patient, you should be able to feel it. Hopefully between these two places, here on the side of the chest and here in the groin, you'll be able to get a heartbeat on your dog. I'm Dr. Q and the rest is up to you. Thank you for watching today. Um, so now we're on to respiratory rates, which should interest you. Um, so, so you wanna figure out again what the normal breaths per minute are. That's what a respiratory rate is, normal breaths per minute. You assess by observation of chest excursion. So how many times the chest is um, inhaling and exhaling. So cats, again, their cats are weird. Um, they breathe a little bit faster than dogs. So 20 to 30 breaths per minute. Um, again, puppies, because they're smaller, 15 to 40 breaths per minute. Um, and then adult dogs, anywhere from 15 to 25 breaths per minute. Um, and certainly panting is a bit diff different. So panting in dogs can be up to 200 pants per minute um, and is normal after exercise, excitement, and to get rid of excess body heat. Um, panting in cats can be up to 300 pants per minute. Um, it indicates extreme stress. Cats do not pant on a regular basis, but we see it all the time in the animal hospital and they're just really stressed out. So we just usually kind of leave them alone for a few minutes and let them calm down and then kind of reassess you know, what we're trying to do with them um, in the exam room. Um, panting is different from open mouth breathing, and I know that sounds kind of weird, but um, there is a difference, and that's not something we're gonna to address today, but um, you know, panting is that big, <laughs> as opposed to an animal. So normally animals wanna breathe through their nose. They don't generally you know, breathe through their mouth when they're at rest. Um, so if you ever watch your dog or your cat and they have their mouth open, um, and things to watch for, again, might be, um, a different kind of chest excursion. So normally when they breathe, their chest doesn't move all that much. But if they're really going, I mean, really hard, tugging in and then letting it relax, there's something wrong with that. That would be an abnormal respiratory pattern or an abnormal respiratory rate. They're using their abdominal muscles to try to open up their chest and then relax. Um, so that would be a concern. That would be something you would want to bring to your veterinarian's attention. Abnormal panting can be recognized when it appears excessive compared to the dog's normal panting pattern. Um, occurs at inappropriate times. So when the dog is not overly warm, um, sometimes people will tell me their dog is panting at night. You know, that's kind of unusual. Why are they panting at night? Uh, and certainly they can be stressed. You know, there's a thunderstorm and they're anxious and scared. You know, that's really common. Um, there are some metabolic diseases that cause animals to pant a bit more. Um, things to do with your adrenal glands. Um, so, so that's, somebody tells me that their dog is panting at night. That's something that we start looking at. Um, 
if it sounds raspier or louder or harsher than normal. Um, so sometimes they can make a funny noise so instead of kind of just, <laughs> you're gonna hear <laughs> something like that. So they're really kind of um, obstructed in the back of their throat that we typically might see with a smooshed face dog. So pugs or Boston Terriers or Bulldogs, they have that lot of excess tissue back there. So it's harder for them to get air, especially if they're really overly warm. Um, so those are the dogs that start to have some heat stroke problems in the summertime. There's also um, something called laryngeal paralysis in some dogs, where instead of the wings of the larynx staying open when you're trying to breathe, one of them is paralyzed, and so it kind of sits there, and they, <laughs> it's more harsh. It's less kind of gaggy in the back, um, but, but kind of harsher. Um, or, or again, um, that kind of abnormal chest excursion, so that, <laughs> you know, really kind of pulling in on their chest. Is that helpful? My imitations, I do this a lot for a living. I make a lot of funny noises. I can do a reverse sneeze too if anybody wants to see that too. So I can do that later, only on request. So an abnormal respiratory rate can indicate pain. A lot of dogs will pant or have a faster heart rate when they're really uncomfortable. We see that at the animal hospital post-operatively. Um, heart disease will make you breathe differently. Certainly lung disease, things like asthma, um, um, COPD, we see that in dogs and cats. Um, again, laryngeal paralysis, um, which again is that kind of that larynx. It's really common in things like uh, golden retrievers. We see that frequently. Um, anemia, because you're trying to breathe more um, to get more oxygen. Um, I'm trying to point to these and realize the pointer isn't up there. Um, anemia, so if you don't have enough red cells and you're not carrying enough oxygen around, you're going to breathe faster to try to oxygenate whatever red cells you have left to move around a little bit better. Um, and then again, metabolic disease. So there are adrenal gland illnesses that make you uh, pant more. So another clinical symptom that we think you guys should be able to, to keep an eye on um, is body temperature. So you can take your pet's temperature rectally. Um, you want to have a dedicated thermometer for your pet. Um, I don't know if they actually make specific like rectal thermometers anymore. We just use a digital thermometer. I guess it's the same one as you hold in your mouth. We just use it up the rear end. Um, you want to use a lubricant like KY jelly or petroleum jelly. Um, in a pinch, you can spit on it. We did that with large animals because you don't really carry KY jelly with you when you go see the cows. Um, so spit works just fine. Um, you want to insert the thermometer, thermometer about a half to a whole inch into their rectum. Cats do not love having their temperature taken. I would not recommend that if you don't have some help, perhaps. Um, that is not a fun thing to do. They don't love that. Um, a normal temperature is between about 101, 102 and a half. That always scares people when we take it in the office and I'm like, oh, look, fluffy is it's 102. And they're like, oh. I'm like, no, that's normal. <laughs> It's not a fever, it's a normal temperature in a dog and a cat. Um, anything over 103, so 103 on a hot day, I will take. If a dog comes in having you know, been running around in the dog park, 103, I'm pretty good with that. But generally between 103 and 104 would be considered uh, a fever. So mucous membranes. Um, so mucous membranes are basically your tissue where you can see the color of your body. So things like um, your gums, so your gums, your gums on your teeth, <laughs> inside your lips, your conjunctiva, so pull down your eyelids, you look in there. Um, dogs and cats have a third eyelid, which we'll talk about in a second. Um, and then in a pinch, if you don't want to go near the dog's face or the cat's face, you can go to the back end and look at their um, vagina or their prepuce. Um, you can see their mucous membranes there. Um, so we look at is something called capillary refill time. And it's the number of seconds it takes for a mucous membrane to return to pink after it's been blanched by finger pressure. So you can do it on yourself, on your thumb. So you can press that. And what you're looking for is it blanches out and it refills really quick. And what that tells me is that you're pushing the blood out of those capillaries and you're letting them refill again. Um, and normal capillary refill time is less than two seconds. So we'll talk about if it's slow. Um, but again, so the so dogs, you can't do that too. They don't do that in thumbs. Um, so again, we look inside their mouth typically, um, under their eyes. Again, this third eyelid, um, if you push their eye in, the third eyelid will, will appear um, and it should be nice and pink, just kind of like the rest of your gum tissue that you should see. It's a protective little membrane um, that covers their eye. So mucous membrane color can indicate serious medical conditions. Um, so if they're white or pale, that would indicate anemia. Um, they can be bleeding internally or externally. So again, there's not enough red cells, so all that mucous membrane tissue is gonna look white or pale. Um, you can be blue. 
um, and that would be because you don't have enough oxygen. So your, the reason your red cells are red is because the hemoglobin in them is carrying oxygen around. It makes a little chemical thing going on, and that's why it's red. If you don't have enough oxygen in there, it's not going to be red. It's going to be blue, kind of like that's why your veins are blue, because that, those veins are bringing unoxygenated blood back to your heart. Um, so your mucous membranes would be the same color. Um, dark red or muddy. Um, muddy is kind of a hard one to describe, but dark red, I mean, they're really, they're brick red. I mean, it's, they're not pink. They're actually really some weird color, and they really do look brick red, and that means that animal is really overheated. Um, and they can be yellow. They can be jaundice. We see that a lot in the corner of their eye, um, or I'm sorry, in the white of their eye. We see it sometimes inside of their ears. Um, but if they're yellowy, that's also kind of a, an inappropriate color for them to be. And then another thing to assess would be mental status. So how is your animal presenting? Is it alert? Does, is it able to ambulate? Can it walk around? Does it know where it is? Um, so it's generally interacting normally. If you call its name, it looks at you. Um, minimally responsive, so they're usually not ambulatory. Little response to the environment. You know, you call their name and they might kind of, you know, look around and see if they can see you. Um, and then we have the unconscious animal, so they could be um, comatose, um, breathing and heart rate are present, but there's no response. Um, you're, it's almost like they're under anesthesia. You're calling to them and there's just no response. Um, causes for that can include trauma, um, you know, just head trauma, um, metabolic disease, uh, such as diabetes or kidney disease, um, that can make you kind of dizzy, and, and um, kidney disease puts a lot of toxins in your system, so they can just kind of be less functional mentally. Um, inflammatory infectious diseases of the central nervous system, um, neurologic disease, so things like, um, you know, a brain tumor or um, what else? Again, kind of like a stroke. Um, and then exposure to toxins and poisons um, can make their mentation different too. I've seen um, a lot of dogs recently and a cat um, that presented because they were high um, and their mentation is altered. So they're just not kind of there. They're happy, but they're, they're not there. <laughs> so it does happen. All right, question, question from the back. Can you just mention something about the dog being high? So with all the Yes, they can die from fentanyl, and that's why a lot of first responders um, is, will carry Narcan for people, but you can use it on an animal. But a lot of police officers that work with police dogs actually will also carry Narcan for their police dogs. So you can, again, inject them, you can use the nasal spray, it's pretty much the same thing. Sure. You're not planning on giving any dogs fentanyl or anything. No, I'm just thinking so many people just take their dogs. Yes. Well, most of it that we see is, I mean, most of what we see is marijuana. So it's, you know, because of the edible stuff. So we're just seeing that, you know, or, and before it was legal, we were having more problems with, you know, the dog was going upstairs to the kids' room and eating the stuff out of their backpack. Um, I saw that quite a bit. Um, yeah. And, but the cat that was high, that was pretty interesting. I'm, I still have no idea what that cat ate, but it was, it was pretty obvious that cat was high. Um, they come in and they're just really kind of lethargic and they just kind of melt onto the floor and their heart rate's about 20 and you just kind of, you, you can't really rouse them. They're just very happy, but they just have a really slow heart rate. Uh, but fentanyl, I mean, that's a life-threatening emergency, and hopefully, unless there are some people that are abusing drugs in your home, you know, sh you shouldn't have your own pet, shouldn't be exposed to that generally. So a working animal might be exposed to that, like a police dog. I mean, and that's a concern. You're right, because they're sniffing stuff, and so if that stuff's loose, like in a car, I think that was one of the things we saw in the news, was that there was some fentanyl, and it had... Um, busted open or whatever, it was just in the car as a powder, and the dog was sniffing it. So, yes, yeah, so they can use um, Narcan for that. For the marijuana, we just let them sleep it off. Sometimes we give them fluids, but that's about it. Is that, does that helpful? Okay. All right, so choking. Um, we see a lot of animals that choke. Um, so my animal, my, my previous dog, um, his favorite thing to do was to um, eat a rawhide chewy and then swallow it down as fast as possible. And I'm thinking to myself, all right, if I give him something else to eat, I would assume that if he has something stuck in his throat, he wouldn't be able to swallow something else. I was wrong. 
I gave him something, watched him swallow, and then just watched him a little bit more, and he's kind of doing a little gulpy stuff and didn't seem comfortable. So I pried his mouth open, and I pulled out the six-inch piece of rawhide that he had jammed into his throat. Um, luckily, you know, so I never gave him rawhide when I left the house because I saw this <laughs> as, a, as a problem that it could occur when, he, when nobody was home. Um, so he managed, he liked to swallow things that weren't appropriate. Um, choking occurs when an object becomes lodged in the airway instead of passing down the esophagus. Um, so normally when you swallow, your little larynx closes, covers over your airway, and puts everything down your esophagus, which leads to your stomach as opposed to your bronchi into your lungs. Um, signs can include noise or coughing on exhalation, um, rasping noise on inhalation, so again, kind of making some noise up here. Sometimes they make no noise. My dog looks perfectly normal. Gagging or retching. Um, a good one is pawing at the face of their mouth, so they're just going to try to paw at themselves because they know that something's stuck in there, but they don't have hands, so they can't pull it out themselves. They're just going to kind of paw at their face. Um, drooling, so they're going to kind of stand there with their head down, kind of again doing some gulpy things, um, and again just drool because they can't swallow it because if it's blocked, all that saliva in their mouth is just going to come out. Neck stretching, um, shallow breathing, blue mucous membranes, and collapsing. So that's kind of the end stage of choking. We hope we don't get to that point. What's the strangest thing you've ever had to surgically remove from a dog's stomach? The strangest thing I've ever had to... Well, oh. I always hear the stories at night, so I'm just asking oh. you. Because know. um, people don't always believe what dogs swallow. All right. Swallow. So I had a cat eat a dime. I have no idea how the cat actually got the dime and why it swallowed it anyway, um, but that was one. I had a, um, there was a plastic football inside a dog's stomach. I have seen, so I took an x-ray and I saw this. And I'm like, okay, so um, it was a GI Joe. <laughs> you know, like the little, like the little plastic soldiers, the little GI Joe things. Um, yes, he was saluting on the x-ray. That was fun. Um, everything. I mean, we've taken needles out of cats. You know, they'll put anything in their mouth. They're not bright. Um, anything will go in. If they can swallow it, they will. My own dog puked up, what? Um, Baloo had a stick. He had peach pits. Um, oh, my, Tycho threw up a piece of asphalt. Why would you eat a piece of asphalt? I do not know. I had that conversation with him. Asphalt. When they're choking, you want to check to see if the, if the pet has an obstructed airway by opening their mouth, gently extending their head and neck forward, pushing their lower jaw down, pulling their tongue out, and looking into the back of their throat. Okay, good luck with that. <laughs> right, I mean, I, I know, but this is what we're supposed to do. Um, do not get yourself bitten. I think that that's probably the big thing because, again, there, um, something is happening up here, and if you're going to jam your fingers in there, they're not going to be too happy about that. So you have to be really careful. Um, and I'm not sure I would necessarily pull their tongue out um, unless they were vaguely unconscious, but certainly you can kind of jam your hand in there down the back of their throat and look for something. Um, can you push it down further by accident? Yes, indeed. But again, maybe if it's moving down the esophagus, maybe they, it'll end up in their stomach as opposed to them trying to you know, breathe. Um, remove any blockage by sweeping material out with your fingers um, and understanding that an obstructed airway will interfere with resuscitation. Um, so if the airway is blocked, no matter how much you try to do CPR in these guys, you're not gonna get air into their lungs because there's something blocking their airway. So, if we have a choking animal, we're going to try to do the Heimlich maneuver. So, if you were unable to remove the obstruction, we're going to perform the Heimlich maneuver. Um, in a small, I know this sounds goofy, but in a small or medium dog, you're going to turn them upside down with the pets back against your chest. So he's a little bit big, but this is what you're going. This is what you're supposed to do. It's this direction. Some people do it this way and, and shake, but I'm not sure that's really helpful. If you have them this way, you can grasp them and then push. And, and then because they're hanging down, it should go that way. But that's going to be the direction that you want to do it with it. I'm not sure I could pick up a 50-pound dog and give this a try, but a small dog or your cat, that's what you're going to do. Um, <laughs> so, so right where their rib cage, and you're going to feel where the rib cage stops and kind of where their stomach goes in. So you're going to make a fist, you're going to put over, and you're going to press in really hard, and they're going to pop it out. That's the theory. Um, in a large dog, you can lift its back end while it's lying on its side. So if the dog is lying on its side, oops, sorry, um, you, can, you can kind of do it this way. So again, kind of that way, so you don't have to kind of pry them up off the ground. You can do it on their side. Stay, Zeus, stay. Um, 
You're going to close your hand to make a fist, place the fist just under the last rib. I mean, it's the same as people, only it's a little different. Grasp fifth with the other hand. With both hands, give five sharp thrusts to the abdomen. If the object is now visible, because they're going to check in their mouth, um, remove it and give several rescue breaths. If the chest does not expand, you're going to try to repeat the abdominal thrusts and, and make sure that you're in the, just give it a drink. Keep trying, just keep trying. There is a lovely photograph of the Heimlich maneuver in a larger dog, and I'm glad that's him and not me. Um, but again, that's essentially what you're going to try to do. And that was a hard picture to find because everybody else was showing the other direction, which actually is not what you're supposed to do. That's the direction you're supposed to do it. So now we have another video on the Heimlich maneuver. This dog is so awesome. Um, I'm impressed with this man being able to do this. Hi there, my name is Dr. Andrew Linklater and I'm one of the emergency and critical care specialists at the Animal Emergency Center. We're going to go over today um, how to do the Heimlich maneuver on a dog in case you were ever to have the, uh, the unfortunate event where um, a choking incident were to occur. So you always want to take a little bit of prevention and make sure that there aren't any um, toys or apple cores or uh, small little racquetballs around the house um, that might actually cause such a thing. But if it were to happen, what do we do? Um, the first thing we want to know uh, is, is what are the typical signs of choking and you'll actually notice that uh, if you look closely and you're able to see their gums or their, or their tongue, hers are nice and pink. Um, if we see a blue color to them, that can be a sign of choking. Often they can be pawing at their face quite frantically like this um, and they actually won't be making any noise like coughing or gagging, that sort of thing. So the first thing if you're able to do it is actually just open up your dog's mouth just like this and sweep the back of the throat with your fingers. It's a good thing to practice at home um, just to get a little bit of a feel for it if they'll, if they'll let you do that. And sweep the back of the throat and remove anything that's abnormal. Now obviously sometimes there's a foreign body that can be lodged quite far back in their throat and so we want to actually try to perform the Heimlich maneuver. Well there's two ways that we can do that in dogs. One is to perform a, a quick thrust to the chest um, which can be performed if they're lying on their side like this and essentially over the widest part of the chest, and you can see the widest part of her chest is right about here, you just want to take both hands and give a quick thrust to the chest like that, a little bit harder than I've demonstrated here, um, and that will hopefully dislodge the object from, uh, from the throat. Now it's not going to go flying across the room, so you do need to again open their mouth and sweep the back of their throat um, to remove the foreign object. The second way that we can perform it, particularly on larger dogs, is just how it's done in people. So if you're standing behind your dog or kneeling behind your dog like this, you can lift them up just like this and take your fist and go up and under um, the, the back edge of their sternum here. Um, and again, a quick upward and forward thrust with both hands ideally. Again, we'll dislodge that object from their throat. And so we just want to go up and forward like that. And if they're standing, you can be standing as well. If they're a rather large dog, you want to go up and forward just like that. Again, you want to take your fingers and sweep the back of the throat to remove any um, object that may have been in there because it's only just going to dislodge it from the airway enough so we can remove it. And that hopefully will never come across, but if it happens, you'll know how to help your pet. Um, I do recommend that if that happens, that you do still get your pet in to see a veterinarian because there are some serious complications that can occur after choking, um, and you can give us a call at the Animal Emergency Center. Did that make sense? That was good? All right. He was, and the dog is like so nice. <laughs> He's like pounding on her and she's like, whatever. All right. So now we're going to talk a little bit about kind of what happens if that, let's say that dog now passes out or that dog is, there's something continuing with the choking problem. So cardiopulmonary cerebral resuscitation, so it's kind of changing names. Um, CPCR is used in an emergency when a pet has stopped breathing and or has no heartbeat. Um, when a pet stops breathing, oxygen levels in the bloodstream fall rapidly and without oxygen, vital organs such as the brain, liver, and kidneys rapidly fail. Brain damage occurs within as little as three to four minutes of respiratory failure, so swift action is crucial. So it's interesting because in people, most um, CPR is performed on someone who has primary cardiac arrest. And when that happens, you still have oxygen in your blood. So when you're doing CPR, you're um, not so concerned about their, it's hard to describe. Um, it has to, yeah, I'm sorry I didn't even get into this conversation. Um, but in animals, they have primary respiratory arrest, so it's a little different. So there's less oxygen left behind in an animal's 
bloodstream than there is in humans, and that's why things have changed kind of in the animal way of doing resuscitation. I think that was a better way of doing that explanation. So CPCR focuses more on chest compressions and less on artificial respirations. It utilizes the theory that chest compressions facilitate the movement of oxygen through the lungs, decreasing the need for administration of breaths. And CPR recommends tens compressions in one breath, and then CPCR recommends 30 compressions in two breaths. So it's a little different on um, what we do with the dogs and the cats. And I think things are changing in human CPR as well. Um, but again, there's less breathing, I think mostly because we're concerned about people putting their mouth on other people's mouths. Um, I have less concern putting my mouth on a dog's mouth. <laughs> <laughs> than with people. Um, but again, it's kind of that difference between what happens with people, and again, they go into primary cardiac arrest, and animals generally have primary respiratory arrest. So despite your best efforts, outcome may not be successful. In humans, the survival rate ranges from 6 to 20%, not great. Um, in animals, they've done some studies that show even in a hospital setting, only 4% of dogs and 9.6% of cats were successfully resuscitated. Um, there's actually a new uh, program put out by the Veterinary Emergency Specialty um, Boarded Group um, called Recover, and I'm actually 80% of the way through my class in CPR training. So it's actually, it's changed. I've been a vet for a long time, but things have changed. Um, so it's always good to keep up with new stuff. Um, rapid initiation of CPCR is critical and must be started within four minutes after the heart stops beating to avoid brain damage. Um, brain damage is irreversible if the brain does not receive oxygenated blood within 10 minutes. So you can see that you need really quick action with this. Uh, determine if the dog is breathing. Unconscious dogs that are breathing do not require a CPCR. So please do not institute CPCR on your dog if it's unconscious but still breathing. It's not going to help. If you're breathing, your heart's beating. Um, observe for chest movement. So again, you can just watch the chest kind of rise and fall, but if you have any concern, um, you can hold some fur or a wisp of cotton or some grass in front of their nose and see if it actually moves. Um, or you can hold a mirror or a piece of glass in front of their nose and see if it gets fogged up. As they breathe out, it should, you should see some condensation on that. It's really not much else other than observing and trying to see if there's any movement out of their nose. So we don't do mouth-to-mouth -mouth resuscitation, we do mouth-to-nose resuscitation. And it sounds kind of goofy, but that's what you have to breathe into, because they have a really big mouth, right? You can't cover your mouth with their mouth. Their mouth goes all the way back here, right? They have huge lips, they go all the way back here. You can't possibly close that off and try to blow into that. So what we do is we try to seal off their mouth and then blow into their nose. So you're gonna place the pet on its side, you're gonna pull their tongue forward a little bit, you're going to close the mouth and pull down the lips to create a So You're not going to like pull his tongue out of his mouth because you don't want him to bite his tongue, but you just want to kind of get it maybe out from the back of his mouth. Um, you're going to close his mouth and pull down on their lips to create a seal. You're going to extend the neck so it's relatively straight because you don't, you, if it's bent, you're not going to get the breaths down into their um, airway, into their lungs. Um, but you want to make sure that when you're doing that, when it's in line with the body, be careful not to exacerbate any existing neck trauma. Um, you're going to breathe into his nose, and you're going to should visualize the chest rising if you're doing a good job. If the chest does not rise, there may be a persistent airway obstruction. Um, so we might have to do some abdominal thrusts again to see if we can get rid of that. Um, the rescuer is not breathing with enough force, so you're just not breathing in hard enough. Um, the rescuer did not make a good seal, so again, it's kind of leaking out. You're bleeding into his nose, it's like leaking out his mouth. Um, so that can be a concern. Um, and then sometimes there's damage to the lungs within the chest cavity, so they can actually have something called a pneumothorax, where the lungs are, are damaged enough that the, when you breathe in, it's just kind of leaking out of the lung into the chest cavity. You can try turning them over and seeing if that actually seals it a little bit, and then trying again. So with compressions, you want to perform those if there's no pulse or heartbeat. So again, you don't want to waste too much time. They suggest waiting, I mean, five seconds. You have to assess whether they're breathing, so you got a pulse. The video will say, don't even check for a pulse because it takes some time so long to find it. Don't even bother, just start, um, especially if they're not breathing. Um, place pet on a solid surface with its right side down and kneel alongside its back. So you're going to right side down, this is your right side, I have a little dyslexia, um, and then you're gonna kneel alongside its backside, so this is where we're gonna do it from, so that direction. Stay there. 
You're going to place the heel of your hand on the left side of its chest. Place the other hand on top of each other and lace your fingers. So that's probably how we learn how to do people CPR. And lean so that your shoulders are over your hands and lock your elbows. And she's going to do a really good um, demonstration of that too. So again, animal's on its right side. You're kind of along its back. You're going to lace your hands together, the heel of your left hand. You're going to lock your elbows and you're going to compress. You're not going to bend your elbows to compress. You're going to lock your arms and use your core and your upper body. He makes a good demo. <laughs> so there are different looking dogs, right? We have like thin, skinny dogs, like a greyhound. We have kind of your average dog, like a Labrador or a Dalmatian. And then we have the square dogs, like a bulldog, things like that. So kind of you're going to try to find their heart or do compressions in different places based on kind of how they're shaped. People are kind of shaped the same. Um, in a round-chested dog, you're going to place your hands over the widest part of the dog's chest. So, you know, if this was a real dog, you know, it's kind of like right over here. In a keel-chested dog, like a greyhound, you're going to go a little further down their chest because they're so long and narrow, you're going to end up more, you know, kind of down, lie down, down this way as opposed to up here. You're going to be more over here because his heart is far lower. Um, and then in a square dog, like a bulldog, you're actually going to do it on his back. You're going to do it here because, again, they're so, that, that rib cage that they have just has so much spring and compression that if you're doing it this way, you're never going to do anything. Um, so you're going to do it from this side because that's going to be easier to get his heart that way. Makes a good model. <laughs> Got that on Amazon. Um, in a small dog or a cat, you're going to use one hand. So you're just going to kind of come from the side and you're just going to use one hand because they're so tiny that if you squish on them like that, you're going to kill them. Um, so you would just kind of use one hand to do it. All right. Does that make sense? Ready? Okay. You're going to administer two breaths for every 30 compressions. Um, large dogs require 60 to 80 compressions a minute. Medium, 80 to 100. Small dogs, 100 to 120. You're going fast. Um, I, think it's not, I think it's faster than the staying alive, staying alive song from the Bee Gees. Um, cats require 150 to 180 compressions. And you note that this, the compression rate has to do with kind of their normal heart rate. So again, that's something that you would check at home. And if you ever had a situation where you needed to provide compressions, you kind of have an idea in your head how many times you should be compressing in a minute. Um, you want to perform two minute cycles. Um, and then you want to alternate with another person if there's somebody available. Uh, because after two minutes, it gets pretty tiring. So you're basically, and the video will show this, you're basically doing this. So you're going to count. You want to count out loud. She doesn't count out loud, which I think is wrong. Um, you should count out loud because the other person who's helping you wants to know. So you're basically going to sit there and, and for 30 times. So I'm not going to do it, but you know what? All right, 28, 29, 30. And then you're going to make the little seal. And then you're going to go back. 28, 29, 30. And just keep going um, for two minutes initially, and then trade. All right, and then compression depth has to do again with kind of the size of the animal, and I'm sure that that actually um, is similar to um, human CPR. You know, you're not gonna compress as hard on a small child as you would on a very large adult. So compression depth should be about a third or a half width of the chest. Um, large dogs, it tends to be about one and a half to two inches, medium an inch, and then small dogs and cats about a half an inch. So again, it's, it's not a huge amount, especially when they're tiny. Um, if, if, you're, if you've got a two-person team and you're doing CPR and you're switching, you, you're doing that with people while you're waiting for first responders to come, but no one's ever coming. You no, you, you were either going to save that animal and get it to the veterinary emergency facility, so yeah, or you're just going to keep going in the back of the car and hope that you drive fast enough. But, but you're waiting for something to occur. What would it be that's telling you? Like the heart is going to, the on. heart's going to start beating on its own, or they're going to take a deep breath in. Okay. And most of the time they were telling you don't take the pulse, but they'll take a deep breath in. That's yes. What you'll see. Well, you're going to you're going to quickly check at some point. Okay. Yes, you have to kind of assess or whether they two people someone quickly check. Yes. Yes. Okay. But you you're you're going to do that until something occurs. Yes. Okay. And again, 4 to 6.9% of them 
in an in-hospital situation, recover. I mean, it's, and, and in an hospital situation, we're going to have an EKG machine attached to them. So we're going to know that the heart's going to start or not. And it's not, not pretty. Do you have any statistics on how many pets die from the rest? Is it cardiac? I'm going to I'm going to give it that 96 no, percent. <laughs> oh no, 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 no like number. spontaneous. Uh, uh, the yeah no the, the number annually out of pets. Oh, I have no idea. Okay. No. Is it it's more than ten? Probably more than ten. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Probably more than I ten. I, I didn't know that. You, you know, know we're being taped for posterity here, and you're asking you great thousands, questions. You have thousands of clients, and I'm yes. just saying, do you know of clients that have had pets that died of? Yes. I do. So certain breeds of dogs, like um, Dobermans, for example, have a high incidence of dying acutely of heart disease. Like I have a woman who basically the dog ran off into the shrubs and didn't come back. And she's calling his name and calling his name and she found him and he was dead. So that's actually not an uncommon presentation. Dogs don't have heart attacks like we do. They don't have atherosclerosis. They don't have blocked blood vessels to their heart muscle. What they do have is um, fatal arrhythmias. So their heart is beating in a pattern that is incompatible with living. Um, and they basically just kind of keel over and die. So that's, that's what happens with an animal with um, kind of an acute cardiac event. Again, it's not a heart attack. They have an arrhythmia and then they die. Um, that's one way. And then I was just thinking of another way and that has now escaped me as I was having that in my head. Um, what else do we see? That's mostly about it. Again, arrhythmia issues. Or, or if they're in congestive heart failure, um, animals suffer from that. They have valvular disease, so their heart doesn't pump blood normally. So eventually, your whole cardiovascular system will fail. But those dogs, that's a progressive chronic illness, and they generally don't die acutely from that. Are there any I'm other good. questions? Good okay. <laughs> OK, all right. Um, so this is our, our this is a lovely British woman, and she would. Do you want to? Can I press this? Will it work now? It, okay. Working. <laughs> All right. It was, it was too loud. loud. All right. Hello, my name is Dr. Erica Tinson, and I'm a veterinarian in emergency and critical care. Cardiopulmonary arrest, meaning the animal is unconscious and not breathing, is associated with low survival rates, as low as 4.1% in dogs and 9.6% in cats. The most effective method of correcting cardiopulmonary arrest is to perform cardiopulmonary resuscitation, or CPR. And I'm going to demonstrate to you today how to correctly perform CPR on a dog mannequin. Before starting CPR, it's important to check for airway breathing and circulation. You can recognize an animal in cardiopulmonary arrest by it being unconscious and not breathing at all. To check for breathing, look for the chest wall rising and falling. Try to wake the animal from its state. Emily! Emily! It's important that this process doesn't take any more than 10 to 15 seconds. It's unnecessary to check for a pulse, as this is very insensitive and will delay CPR efforts, which will negatively impact survival outcome. Before starting CPR, try to call for help. There are a few key components in performing CPR correctly. First, we'll look at animal and hand positioning. Lie the animal on its left or right side. For round-chested dogs like Labradors or mid to large breed dogs, perform compressions over the highest point of the chest. For keel-chested dogs like Boxers and Dobermans or small dogs and cats, perform compressions directly over the point of the heart. You can locate the point of the heart by moving the elbow backwards slightly to the point where it meets the chest. There are exceptions and these are the flat chested breed dogs, like the French Bulldogs. In these breeds, you'll need to roll the animal onto its back and perform compressions directly over the sternum. Secondly, we'll just look at the correct hand technique to be used during CPR. We use a double-handed technique whereby one hand is positioned over the top of the other hand. The shoulders are positioned directly over the hands and the elbows should be locked. When compressions are performed, you're bending at your waist rather than bending the elbows. So it should look a little bit like this. Thirdly, it's important that chest compressions occur at a rate of around 100 to 120 beats per minute. 
Chest compressions should also be quite hard in large breed dogs. The chest needs to be compressed by about one half to one third of the chest width. So it should look a little bit like this. It is important not to lean on the animal when performing CPR. So in between chest compressions, the chest needs to fully re-expand to maximize CPR effectiveness in moving blood around the body. Leaning on an animal when performing CPR might look like this, whereas we want it to be more like this. It's also important to allow CPR to run for at least two minutes uninterrupted and minimize pauses. In a lot of settings, intubation is not possible. In these situations, we need to provide mouth to snout ventilation. What we do is provide two breaths for every 30 compressions performed. To provide the breaths to the animal, make sure that the mouth is tightly closed so that any breaths delivered via the nostrils do not escape by the mouth. Try to keep the head and neck extended and straight as well so that any breaths delivered make it straight the way down to the thorax. So putting it all together, a correct CPR performed on a dog should look like this. After two minutes of uninterrupted CPR, very briefly pause for less than five seconds to check and see whether your animal is showing any signs of spontaneous breathing, any signs of consciousness, or whether you can feel a heartbeat. If the animal is still in cardiopulmonary arrest, recommence two minutes of uninterrupted CPR immediately. Thank you for watching this video, and I hope you are now more confident in performing CPR on a dog. Any questions? Larry. Um, it's, uh, it's conceivable that it's a year old, if you can. Yes. The pet's been yours for 10 years. Mm -hmm. And he stops breathing. He's unconscious, he stops breathing, and you, you're panicked. We don't remember anything about what you taught us today because it happens when you're right. in a panic situation. Absolutely. So you call 911. No, you don't. You don't? Okay. What do you do with this first responder issue? So there, there is no first responder. You are the first responder. You're it. So if you're panicked, just throw them in the car and you're calling the emergency center or not, or hopefully you have, you know where it is, you know, so the, where's, the, where's the closest veterinary emergency clinic in your area? So that's what you're going to do. Throw them in the car, drive as fast as you can without killing anybody. That's what you need to do. Yep. The first responders are not going to come and take care of your pet. They're only going to take care of your pets in the case that they've already responded to a house fire or things like that, and there are animals there. So actually, the Massachusetts Right Medical Association, their charitable arm, actually provided oxygen masks to pretty much every um, fire station in the state of Massachusetts. So they have these oxygen masks that are pet specific. They're not any different really than human oxygen masks, but people don't want to use you know, the human ones on the animals or the animal ones back on the humans. Um, and there's a special adapter that goes to their oxygen tank. So we actually have, there's been, you always see them on the, you know, on the nightly news that there's some fireman who rescued some cat from a, you know, burning apartment building. Um, so we, we kind of teach those skills. We teach them how to, you know, approach that animal, how to get it without getting yourself scratched and bitten. Um, you know, CPR we teach them and then we teach them you know again basic kind of first aid bandaging stuff like that but they're only there to do that if they're responding to a human emergency and if they have the opportunity to include the animals in that emergency response we usually tell them they have to check with their um, commanding officer to see if resources can be diverted to do that um, but no you cannot call 911 they will not show up if your dog is doing that even even Hillary Cohen the animal control officer she's not going to respond to that so you have to make sure that uh, I'm, um, so they might try to talk you through it on the phone, but I doubt it. They're you know just going to tell you to just get there as fast as you can. So you really need two people. Um, to, to and one and one while you're driving, and one while driving. Yeah, that would be great. Yeah, 
but but does it happen that there's yeah oh no it's there are terrible things I could tell you story after story after story so now we can talk about bleeding because that's an awesome one too <laughs> so, so surprisingly and animals are far smaller than we are blood loss as little as 10 mls which is two teaspoons per pound can cause shock um, so blood loss is is pretty important um, you want to Try to apply direct pressure with a clean compress over the wound. I don't care what it is, kitchen towel, you know, pot holder, doesn't matter. Just grab something and try to put some direct pressure on it. And even if you have to use your hands, I don't care. Your sweatshirt, whatever works. Um, if the blood soaks through the compress, don't remove it. Add more stuff because you might be getting some clotting there. And if you pull it off, you're just going to disrupt that clot that's forming. So just keep putting more stuff on the bandage and, and wrapping it. Um, you know, kitchen towels with some duct tape. That works. You know, you can think of anything in a pinch. Um, just something to put some pressure on that. Um, if the wound is on an extremity, you can try elevating it above the level of the heart by placing it on a folded towel or a pillow or something like that. Um, but I'm not sure that would necessarily work <laughs> in a real emergency situation. Um, but again, kitchen towels and some kind of wrap, duct tape, awesome. I've seen worse. <laughs> but those are my favorite, the kitchen towels with the duct tape that person was thinking. So we have our little chart here. So if bleeding still does not diminish, you can apply pressure to areas where the arteries supplying the injured area are located. So the foreleg is gonna be a big blood vessel in your armpit called the brachial artery. So you can try to put pressure up into their armpit. Um, for a hind leg, their inner thigh again, that femoral artery. So you can try putting your, you know, your pressing on that. Um, we see a lot of tail wounds, you know, they get bitten, they get stuck in the door. Um, I remember my dog crashing through the screen and he would get it caught and then he'd come in the house and he's happy, he's wagging his tail. Looked like Charles Manson had been to my house because there was blood everywhere, wall, ceiling, everywhere. Um, so there's a caudal artery right under the base of their tail. So you've lifted up their tail and you can kind of, you know, pinch around the base of their tail. Um, their front foot, that big major pad that's kind of heart shaped, um, there's a blood vessel right at kind of at the top of that. You just press your thumb right in there. Um, that's the palmar digital artery. And then the hind foot, same thing, there's a plantar digital artery. So again, you can kind of press right behind that major pad where that little indent is. That's so cute. Um, but there's a big artery there. So you can press on that and that should help. So with wound care, you want to wrap over the gauze pads with some roll gauze and then apply some self-adhering elastic bandage. I got some samples of that somewhere. There was a little baggie I had. I can show you that. We can wrap up Zeus's leg if you want to. Um, avoid placing the bandage too tightly. You want to watch for swelling above or below the bandage. But again, this is kind of an emergency situation. So if you just slap a bandage on there and then you drive them to the animal hospital, I wouldn't worry too much about swelling. Um, but let's say for bandage care afterward, um, you want to replace a bandage um, daily if possible. Animals sweat through their feet. Animals don't sweat like we do. They don't have a lot of sweat glands. They pant, so that's how they get rid of a lot of excess heat. But they also sweat through their feet. So I often show people, it's always cats. Cats are really awesome when they come in and they get nervous. They have little sweaty feet. They have little sweaty footprints on the table. People have no idea they have little sweaty paws, but they do that. Um, and the bandage gets damp um, and it's just disgusting if you leave it on for too long. So you don't want the sweaty bandage on this animal, plus the fact they pee, um, and it's wet outside, so you want to make sure that bandages are changed every day because they get pretty damp. Um, consider using an Elizabethan collar, which is the cone of shame, um, or a booty <laughs> to prevent chewing at their bandage, and, and we have a lovely picture of the cone of shame. <laughs> with the bandage. Um, those are awesome because sometimes they'll say, you know something, we need to let that breathe for a while. I don't want the dog to lick at it. So maybe if you get the cone on the dog's head, you know, that would be really helpful. So that's why we put them on, not to torture you, not to torture the dog. Yes, the animal can sleep with it on. They can usually eat. Um, usually what they do is they bang into doorways because they can't figure out how wide it is. And then stairs around the problem. They usually catch the bottom. You just have to teach them how to lift their head up a little bit. But yes, e-collars are a good thing. So kind of moving on to like different problems that you might see. So if it ever warmed up here, um, <laughs> we might see dogs with hyperthermia. Um, so body temperature greater than 104 degrees indicates hyperthermia. Causes can include excessive activity in hot weather. Um, one of my favorite things to see probably in the next couple weeks, usually we see it around marathon day, is people decide to take their dog for a walk. Um, for the first long walk and it's now it's 80 degrees out and the dog is like 
all right, I am really overly warm. Um, and they come in and, and we see heat stroke all the time, especially in certain breeds of dogs. The brachycephalic breeds are the ones with the smooshed faces. Um, so uh, the bulldogs, uh, pugs, Boston Terriers, Lhasas, Shih Tzus, anything with kind of a smooshed face without a jaw, they have a really hard time breathing and they have all that excess tissue at the back of their mouth. So dogs also with laryngeal paralysis, because again, they can't open their airway enough. And then obese dogs, again, just have too much stuff and they can't breathe. Um, signs include excessive panting, dark red gums, and increased heart rate. And sometimes they'll be drooling or vomiting or having diarrhea. Um, essentially their body is starting to break down. So treatment includes cool wet towels, not cold. You want cool. Um, so we don't recommend ice packs, because sometimes you can ice them and, and not only cause them damage to the skin, um, but you can cool them too quickly. Um, so you want cool wet towels and a fan. You want to cool them until their temperature is about 103, and then you take temperature every 10 minutes to make sure you didn't send them the other direction. So you don't want to necessarily cool them until their temperature is normal, because their temperature will continue to drop. So short nose breeds, such as pugs, terriers, lhasa opsos, bulldogs are more susceptible. Um, it occurs if the animal is left in a confined space with no ventilation, such as um, being left in your car with the windows rolled up um, during hot and humid weather. Uh, it can result in brain damage, kidney failure, cardiac arrest, and death. Um, getting your temperature that high will kill you. Um, symptoms include heavy panting, gasping, drooling, vomiting, diarrhea, body temperature greater than 104, brick red or blue gray mucous membranes, and then they lose consciousness. So the goal of first aid is to remove the animal from the enclosed space, um, prevent internal temperature from continuing to rise, and transporting to the nearest emergency facility because these dogs have some really significant metabolic disease going on here. Um, so move to a cooler environment, a shaded area, indoors with a fan or air conditioning, um, apply lukewarm to cool water to its paws, armpits, groin, abdomen. Cold water will cause superficial blood vessel constriction and trap heat inside. So again, the dog's already cooking. We, went and we don't want to keep it cooking anymore. We want everything to move along. Oops, sorry about that. Um, you can apply rubbing alcohol to the inner ears and pads of the feet for additional cooling. Again, it has to do with evaporation, so that works. Um, taking temperature frequently, discontinue cooling measures when it reaches 103 as the animal may become hypothermic. And then we have hypothermia. So this is the opposite. A body temperature that's less than 99 degrees um, indicates hypothermia, exposure to cold temperatures. So newborn puppies and kittens are fairly susceptible because they don't have a lot of thermal regulation going on there. Um, elderly and debilitated pets. Um, signs include shivering, lethargy, weakness, very slow heart rate. Um, treatment includes just the opposite. So applying warm blankets to reduce further heat loss, placing in a warm environment. Um, so warm blankets, so run them through the dryer, kind of warm them up a little bit, that's helpful. You don't want to use a heating pad because they tell you when, you, when humans use a heating pad, don't fall asleep because it can cause some pretty serious burns. Um, and if they're too sick or debilitated to move away from the heating pad because it's too hot, they will also get burned. Um, poisoning, so this is, we see this a lot. We see this a lot. Rat poison, it's classic. Um, size matters. So the ability for a potentially poisonous substance to cause damage is proportional to their body weight. So if a, you know, a chihuahua eats um, a Hershey's bar versus you know, a Great Dane eats a Hershey's bar, you're gonna have less problems with the Great Dane eating the Hershey's bar than the chihuahua eating the Hershey bar. Um, so common signs of poisoning can include muscle tremors and seizures, vomiting and diarrhea, possibly with blood, uh, drooling, foaming at the mouth, lethargy or anxiety, blisters on their mouth or their skin where the substance made contact, increased heart rate, respiratory rate. Um, so all sorts of, can show up as a lot of different things depending on what the chemical or the drug was. So there is a great app by the ASPCA and I have it on my phone because I check it all the time when somebody calls and says, my dog ate. You know, whatever, you know, is, it, is it poisonous? I'm like, all right, I have to check. So some things that you don't think are poisonous, you know, can be very significantly a problem. Um, things like prenatal vitamins with a lot of iron in them. Um, I had a woman who was using some kind of um, estrogen cream, or there's one with vitamin D. So some of these weird things can actually cause some problems. Um, so you definitely want to check with the ASPCA Poison Center Control phone app. It actually works really well. Um, they have an ASPCA Poison Control Center, and that's that phone number. I would recommend having it in your phone if you have a pet. There is a fee of $65. You can pay with a credit card. 
Um, and they give you a case number, and that's helpful to me. So what you want to do is write down that case number and then bring it with you. Um, or when you're calling and telling me that you're on your way with your poison pet, give me the case number, and then I will be prepared as to what I need to do when you get there. So that's very helpful. Um, critical information that you're going to give to them includes the weight of your pet, what was ingested, how much was ingested, and how long ago it was ingested. So those are kind of critical things. I have people, um, I had a client come in with their cat um, who had been playing up in the attic, and he went up to see what the cat was playing with, and it turned out it was an empty package of rat poison that somebody had stuffed into some rafters or something. We don't know if the cat ate it, right? The rats or the mice could have eaten it and all he was playing with was the goofy packaging, but we had really had no idea. So just to be on the safe side, so we, you know, we, he had called poison control and we treated the cat with vitamin K for 30 days. He had to shove pills down his cat's throat for a month. And then we rechecked its clotting time at the end of that to make sure that, you know, there had been no change from the clotting time that we took originally. Um, they will eat anything, you know. Who knows why they do it, but they will definitely eat anything. The cat could have eaten a mouse that ate rat poison, and that's poison. that's harder to tell sometimes with that secondary thing. But yeah. yes, that can happen. Yeah. yeah, that they can actually eat something that's been poisoned, and some of that poison is residual enough. Um, although a lot of those poisons don't act instantaneously, so depending on when the animal died, which could be a week or two later. So most of those rat poisons are anticoagulants, um, and so they, the animals, so use the snappy traps, just kill them, right? Don't use the glue trap because they're gonna starve to death and that's really ugly. And do you really want a little mouse stuck to the glue? That's disgusting, why would you do that? So snap traps, breaks their neck, they're dead. Don't use rat poison, because again, your animals can get into it, number one, and number two, it's a really icky way to go. Um, yes, Fran. <laughs> I was just gonna share a story about um, animations in a house that was um, sort of like a pain because it was a home. And the dog that was part of the family ended up with lead poison. Yes, absolutely. Because they chew on the windowsill, especially if it's an older home, or again, the paint's flaking off. Yeah. Because they were renovating, so there was a lot of dust. Yeah. Hopefully they didn't have small children. That would have been terrible, too. Yes. What about spraying for insects? So most insecticides aren't necessarily toxic to animals. I guess, it, it, again, it depends, because if they tell you that, not specifically because they're targeting, so insects have different kind of neurochemicals that they're targeting as opposed to humans. But if it says you need to leave the house, your pets need to leave the house too. I think people forget that. So I would board my animals for the day if I was having you know, the exterminator coming in or I was spraying something in the house. Because if it smells funny to you, it makes you feel weird, it is definitely affecting your pets for sure. So, I mean, it, it's interesting, again, so again, they're kind of targeting other stuff. So we used, we had, um, what was it? Hormigos locos, we had crazy oh, ants. <laughs> we, had these, these, we had these ants, but the, when it says in Spanish, the translation means they're crazy ants. I'm not sure why they're crazy. Um, but those ant traps is basically just bait that they bring back that the ants coming in will eat it and then bring it back to the nest and they'll die. Those are actually completely non-toxic. People call about ant traps all the time. Those are completely non-toxic to animals. So are those weird little like silicone packages they tell you do not eat. Those are non-toxic. Animals like to eat that too. So there's a bunch of stuff that looks like it should be poisonous but isn't. And then people on the other side, you know, it is poisonous and you should do something quickly. Um. <laughs> I, that's, yeah. So, in terms of like a chemical product, yeah. I mean, I, I guess like the True Green and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. So, I, yeah. So I think they tell you that you should stay off of it for a period of time. If I had a really small dog, I might wait a lot longer to put my animal back on that um, than maybe a larger dog. I would definitely follow the directions. I would ask them to show me, you know, even potentially what they, um, they don't call them MSDS sheets anymore, but something, some, some information about what you should watch for, what the toxins are. Um, I have a big concern about all those, uh, you know, flea and tick products that they that they spray now for people who don't want mosquitoes and ticks in their yard because that literally kills 
every insect, which I don't think is appropriate because we don't have pollinators, we're all gonna die of starvation. And as Gary suggested, we keep bees. And so those things can come and float around or you know, my bees go and land in your yard and you use some weird insecticide and um, now my bees are gonna die. Um, so according to the federal government, bees are actually now animals. As, an, as a veterinarian, I can actually, I have to, there are diseases that need uh, a prescription to um, provide antibiotics to certain bees with certain diseases. Um, so, so when you say keep the dog off for a while, or, I mean, is this just like if the dog was outside? Yes, yeah, so like going to the bathroom, like yeah. tr watching right. through it, so yeah. After I would certainly, again, I would, I would talk to the well, that's company the and try to, by a company right, right. I try to find out what chemical they're using. I don't think that would be inappropriate. I think that they would need to provide that information to you. Yeah. Absolutely. Especially if you have a pet. Yeah. And you're saying fertilizers, but weed kills. Weed kills. Oh, terrible. Horrible. Yes. Women. Yeah, no, they're awful. So. We don't, yeah, we try not to use a lot of stuff around our house because we've always had pets and we've always had bees and um, yeah, that stuff is bad. We, and we don't have nice grass, <laughs> and that's okay. I'm, you know, dandelions are the first food that bees eat in the spring, so dandelions are important actually for pollen and nectar for bees, so yes. So think about the bees, we love the bees. Um, but yes, all that stuff can be toxic to your pet, absolutely. Are cats more susceptible because they're constantly grooming? I mean, I think they can be, certainly if they get it on their fur. Absolutely. Yeah. So they're like rolling around the grass and they come in and groom themselves. Absolutely. Um, all right. So with poisoning, never induce vomiting unless instructed by your veterinarian. So some things are caustic, right? So you don't want to necessarily have them drink like um, Dorino and then puke that back up again because it's going to burn down going one day and it's going to burn coming out the other way. So do not induce vomiting unless instructed by your veterinarian. If advised to do so, you can administer some hydrogen peroxide at a rate of about a tablespoon for every 10 to 15 pounds orally. So I would get myself an oral syringe or a turkey baster, and then you are going to be squishing hydrogen peroxide down their throat. They don't like it. It doesn't taste really great, and it foams, and it's all nasty. Um, some dogs will, will take it pretty easily. Um, and if they don't throw up in the first 10 or 15 minutes, um, what you'd want to do is actually take them for a little jog. So if you actually move it around, it actually works better. And how to describe that, but you can actually take them, we tell people to take them for a walk or put them in the car. I guarantee you they'll throw up in the car. <laughs> so. That always works. You want to collect the vomit because sometimes you want to see what's in it. So rat poison tends to be an awesome blue-green kind of aqua color, kind of the color of your shirt. Um, and for some reason, they, they always do it that color so I can tell if it threw up the rat poison just by looking at the, at the vomit. Um, you want to bring the container so we know what the chemical is um, and take the pet to the um, veterinary emergency room. Um, how can you assure that if you're Putting stuff down their throat, it's going down their throat and not their lungs. Because you want to put it in their mouth and they should, you should watch them swallow. So you're not like prying their mouth open and just kind of jamming it down. So it, the best way to give something orally that's a liquid to a pet is you can keep their mouth closed and just stick it right in there. So you stick it between their clenched teeth and their cheek. And if you tip their head back a little bit, they're just going to swallow it down. They might drool it back out a little bit, um, and especially if they tip their head forward. But if you can kind of keep their, keep their head back a little bit, um, they'll actually swallow it back. So yes. open mouth insert syringe no. closed mouth? No. <laughs> then what? Just keep I mouth closed with teeth clenched yes. and pry in between the back teeth? No, you don't want to pry between their mouth. Just stick it between their clenched teeth. Are you paying attention? I am. I, am. I, was, I, I was taking notes. I was taking but they got it. Okay. All right. Maybe you should be sitting over there. <laughs> I'm go for You're all done with videos. No, anyway. no, no. So right in here. Yeah, just stick okay. it right there. You don't have to press. Yeah, oh, enough space. Do, so is it going? It's just going back the, down the back of your throat. Behind the teeth. Try, you know, squishing water in your mouth. Behind the teeth. Just behind okay. there. It'll just all drip down. Next time you could bring syringes. I could. <laughs> Dose. That's right. We're not talking like one flew over the cuckoo's nest or anything okay. here. You know. <laughs> I will. I will attempt to. <laughs> I 
mean, I guess if it's, I guess the only problem is that even if, so things that are organic can still be fairly toxic depending on kind of the level of potassium, nitrogen, and what is the third thing that they're using in there. So there's a, those three components. But I think certainly that's likely to be less toxic than some of the other stuff. But yeah, a lot, I mean, if it says, if there's a big skull and crossbones on it or, you know, avoid this or avoid that, I mean, you just have to do some label reading. Yeah. Oh, and my favorite is like, I, yeah. No, cocoa bean mulch, and I'll talk about that in a second, but that's a big one because it's like, oh, chocolate all over the garden. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah, that was whoever invented that I never had a pet. I have no idea. But yeah, I mean, everything can be toxic to some degree because they're, they're this big, some of them. Poisons are not always directly ingested. Um, poisons can be absorbed through the skin or mucous membranes. They can be absorbed through the eyes. They can be inhaled, so aerosols, carbon monoxide, chemical fumes, um, and they can be injected. So things like insect stings and snake bites, things like that can be a problem. I've never seen snake bites. We don't actually have that many around here, but my sister's dogs actually, um, both of them got bit by little baby rattlesnakes, and they were little dogs. They actually cost her a lot of money. Um, they have um, like rattlesnake venom um, medication that they give. It was, yeah, pretty impressive. But these little guys were in the hospital for a couple of days because one dog got, was playing with the rattlesnake and then got bitten and the other dog went over to see what happened. <laughs> so common household poisonings, toxins. Um, antifreeze is a big one. That's sweet. Um, so you spill some antifreeze, the cat goes over and takes a lick. Um, batteries, lead, oil, detergents and bleach. You, know, you think those little packages are interesting to kids? Well, they're interesting to dogs too. Um, pool chemicals, um, liquid potpourri and glue. Um, human medication, so nicotine, so some dogs eat like cigarette butts and stuff like that. And I can't tell you how many times people call and say, I dropped my, you know, fill in the blank. Number one, I feel bad because that's a lot of information that somebody's putting on me because I don't necessarily want to know what my human <laughs> clients are taking for medication, but it's nice that they'll share that with me. Um, but you know, sometimes they'll rip open the package or they drop on the floor and the dog just vacuums them up. So that, can, that happens a lot. Um, and then garden product, fertilizers, herbicides, fungicides, insecticides, and rodenticides. So all of those can be toxic. So we have indoor and outdoor plants that can be toxic as well. So alliums are like all the, like the garlic and the chives. Um, amanita mushrooms, I'm not sure we have those here. Those are like, like the weird little elf mushrooms are red with little white spots on them. Um, amaryllis, those lovely bulbs that we get for Christmas. Um, azaleas, everybody has those in your front yard. Um, castor beans, again, I'm not sure how much we have that, but that's what makes ricin, which kills people. Um, crocuses, daffodils, tulips, so all those bulbs. Um, cyclamen, actually, I didn't even know that one. Um, day lilies and Easter lilies, cats that eat lilies die. So lilies and cats are horrifying, cause a lot of uh, renal disease and, and that will kill them. Um, Diffenbachia, which is, um, they also call it dumb cane. Um, some of them are a lot of gastric irritation or mouth irritation. Um, Foxglove has digitalis in it, which is actually a heart medication that will kill you. Um, hops, people like to brew their own beer, so hops is a problem. Um, Calancho, I'm never had, sure how to pronounce that one. Lilies of the Valley. Oleander, also a killer. Um, rhubarb, mostly the leaves, not the, not the stalks. Um, sago palms, those are those cute little palms that they sell at Home Depot and Lowe's, those cute little ones in a bowl, incredibly toxic. Um, they should put some kind of, we've actually been, I think somebody in the vet school was trying to get them to label it, you know, that it was an, an, a problem with animals. I'm not sure they ever did. Um, and then yews, those Japanese yews out front um, of your home with the little red weird mucusy berries, those are really toxic to animals too. So a lot of ornamentals are actually quite toxic. Um, and then toxic food. <laughs> So a lot of things. So alcohol, obviously, hops, um, apple seeds, because they have cyanide in them. So I would give my, I would try to pick the seeds out of the core and then give my dog the apple core, but um, apple seeds. Um, rising bread dough, that will rise in your dog's stomach um, and that will cause some problems. I have seen that happen. Happens not infrequently. Um, chocolate, coffee, caffeine. Um, coconut oil and coconut water. Um, the oil is really fatty and can cause some gastrointestinal problems. Um, I'm not sure about the coconut water, but I got this off a list that I was reading, and I apologize if I don't know all of it. Um, garlic and onions and chives, those we know, are, are very toxic in high concentrations in animals. What's interesting is that baby food has garlic powder in it. 
I don't know why you do that to your kid, but um, maybe it makes it taste better. But we often have elderly cats that aren't eating a lot, and so we would recommend baby food. But you have to recommend the baby food without the garlic powder in it, because for a long time I didn't realize that a lot of baby food had garlic powder in it until I went and I looked at it at the supermarket. Um, so that's an issue. Grapes and raisins. So we don't know what the weird chemical is. So I used to give my dog grapes all the time. This is a long time before grapes apparently were bad, but we're not sure whether it's an inherent thing in the dog or whether it's some weird thing on the grapes or the raisins that are a problem, whether it's a fungus or a fungicide that have been used recently, but there's really no, nobody knows why grapes and raisins are toxic for dogs. But I have people that say, my dog just ate, you know, the batch of oatmeal raisin cookies and stuff like that, and we make them come in and throw up now. You know, or they ate the little sun-made box out of my kid's lunch. Okay, now he's gotta puke. Um, macadamia nuts and walnuts are toxic. Um, avocados were on the list too, but mostly for birds. So that was none of the guys have any birds. That was a problem. Um, persimmon, peach, and plum pits. Again, they have a lot of cyanide. Um, rhubarb and tomato leaves. Not the tomatoes, but the leaves. Um, tobacco, marijuana. Vitamins intended for humans, again, with a lot of iron and vitamin D that can be really toxic. And then another thing, so xylitol, so sugarless gum. Dogs think that's awesome, but it actually um, causes low blood sugar, and they can die from having low blood sugar. So any kind of xylitol or artificial sweeteners can be really toxic for animals. And then we have the favorite chocolate toxicity. <laughs> so yeah, dogs like chocolate. So the darker it is, the more harmful it is because it contains more theobromine, which is a cardiac stimulant and a diuretic. It causes vomiting, diarrhea, increased heart rate, seizures, and death. Been a vet for 32 years, I've never seen a dog die from chocolate, but they can get really pretty sick. Um, so again, milk chocolate, um, it's a fairly large amount, so an ounce per pound, dark chocolate, half an ounce, baker's chocolate, quarter of an ounce, cocoa powder, it's actually a pretty small amount, and then that fun cocoa bean mulch. Um, so, and it smells like chocolate, so I would not use that because they will eat it. Um, my favorite phone call, I, <laughs> I love this client, Pam. Um, she had these cute little teeny dogs. She called me once and she's, she's crying. She's like, my dog just ate a Snackwell's chocolate cookie. I'm like, Pam, I don't think Snackwell's chocolate cookies have any chocolate in them. They were just brown. So we had that conversation. She felt much better after that, but I'm pretty sure it had actually no chocolate in it. But chocolate, again, we see this a lot. Cats never eat chocolate, just dogs. Cats are smarter in some way, but not so much in others. Um, so pet first aid kit. So I have a list over there too you guys can take home. Um, but simple things you can just put together in a big baggie, put it in a shoe box. I don't care. We have one that we're raffling off today that has a lot of stuff in it. So gauze squares and roll gauze, adhesive or self-adhering tape. So we have something called vet wrap, which is, they also have it in the um, CVS now. You can get it. It kind of sticks to itself. So you wrap it around and it's rubbery and it kind of sticks on, which is great. Um, quick stop powder or styptic powder, they call it styptic powder. Um, you can use, so how many people have the, whose husbands you shave now with a razor, right? Um, so that styptic pencil, that works too, but it also comes as a powder. Um, you can also stick them in a bar of soap if you cut their nails too short, that'll help. Um, flour is another one I hear a lot. If you put flour on like a bleeding toenail, that'll help. Or cinnamon. Um, was it cinnamon or nutmeg? There was one of the two. Um, but some things can help kind of stop bleeding fairly instantaneously. Just get the little thing of yellow powder, it's fine. Um, cotton balls and swabs, scissors, tweezers, hydrogen peroxide, sterile saline eye wash. So if your dog gets something in its eye, you can just flush it out with just some contact lens solution, works really well. Antibiotic ointment, so you know, Neosporin, Best Tracin, um, some, some of those cold packs that if you crush them, they become cold instantly. Um, Dawn dish soap. Not a plug for Dawn, but it um, actually works really well for removing grease and oil. They use it for the oiled birds, right? So it's actually pretty mild and does what it's supposed to. Some Benadryl, so if your dog gets stung by a bee, you can give them some Benadryl. Um, we use that all the time. Had a little dog coming the other day with hives all over it. <laughs> I have no idea what she got into, but she was literally just hivey all over her little body. Um, oral dosing syringes, you can get them in CVS for um, babies. Uh, you can probably ask your vet if they'll give you one or two or sell you one or two. It's always good to have for that hydrogen peroxide administration. Um, another thing to use is a uh, turkey baster. Thermometer and lubricant, blanket or a towel, the animal poison control number, your veterinarian contact information, and where the emergency vet in your town is. So all good things to have in your first aid kit. And then a 72-hour kit, so back to kind of disaster preparedness. Um, what would you put together if you needed to leave the house with your pet? Um, 
you know, so a big, nice Rubbermaid container with a bunch of stuff in it. You can throw in food, um, dry and canned food for three days. Um, with water, you want to estimate about an ounce per pound per day for three days. Um, so that's generally what you want to bring for yourself and your pet. Um, bowls and a can opener, unless you're using pop-top cans. A photo of you and your pet. Um, that's important because if you guys get separated or the dog goes to the animal shelter and you end up in the human shelter, you want to make sure that you can prove that this is your pet because people will try to adopt your pets um, out from underneath you. Many, many people with Katrina never got their animals back. They got fostered out. They got just lost in the system. It's really just horrific. Um, you want a copy of its medical records if possible, especially if it has some underlying disease, microchip information, rabies tag and certificate so you can prove that your dog has been vaccinated for rabies. Some toys, a leash and a collar with some tags on it, um, some bedding, blankets, towels, cat carrier, a crate. Um, medications, if your animal is on chronic medication, you want to have some of those in there. Heart and prevention, flea and tick product. Paper towels, cleaning solution, plastic bags, poop bags. It's not, a, it's not a good word for poop bag, <laughs> other than poop bag. Um, a litter box and some kitty litter, um, a flashlight or some glow sticks when you have to take them out for a walk at night, and then throw in that first aid kit. And that is it. Thank you. Thank You're you welcome. So Yay. Thank you.